something to learn. Um, and yes, basically I will be speaking about um, my current project that is now about to finish. And we still are processing data and, and generating results and discussing them, but um, there's certainly enough to discuss. And what I want to start with is uh, precisely with crops, because as archaeologists, when you speak about agriculture, that your mind goes directly to the plants that were being grown. But of course, this is um, a lot more complex. And what we've tried to do within the project is to look at a series of proxies. Uh, these are uh, profile views of silo pits, so they inform us about storage. We have, have been looking at insect remains, potential pests, also wild plants that complement the diet. We've been measuring stable isotopes, radiocarbon dating, and looking at a broad region. So trying to think beyond the plants themselves, but at the same time, they are at the very core of the um, project. So with the goal that um, everybody is kind of with me during the presentation, I will start explaining a, a little bit the Neolithic and farming in the Northwest Mediterranean region where we've been working. Then the project with uh, some examples already there, because at, at the end of the presentation, I will focus it on, on two moments where we observe changes in the um, agricultural practices, basically in the crops that are being grown. And so we'll focus the discussion on that only, even though we did eventually uh, loads of other things. So when we speak about the Neolithic in our area, this changes depending on the part of Europe where you are working. We start roughly around 5,800 BC and it goes roughly until 2,300 BC. So a few years ago, we'll be working on this area here. As you can see, these are, I don't know if you see the dots anyway, these are all radiocarbon dated sites to this uh, chronological period. What you see here is what we call the sum radiocarbon probability distributions, which basically is adding up all the whole probability distribution of each radiocarbon date ever done in this area so that you get a curve that kind of indicates intensity of activity being dated at the time. So uh, you get a, a very quick uh, overview on um, an archaeological phenomenon. And I don't know if it will help, but I chose two kind of uh, milestones to kind of locate ourselves. If you've ever uh, been into archaeological topics, uh, at the beginning of the Neolithic in Europe, which um, comes from Southwest Asia and spreads towards the Balkans, uh, one of the main features are these clay figurines that are really amazingly uh, preserved um, from the point of view of design is something again, very unique and they come back, they call them house models. They usually have like a, the head of a person on top of it and maybe they would burn um, incense or um, some sort of uh, plant uh, material on top and yeah, they are very famous and many books have been written about them. And the period kind of ends with Stonehenge, which is a, a late uh, Neolithic monument. So we are there in between um, these um, epochs. And good to know also is that the Neolithic spread towards the Northwest Mediterranean region um, per sea, so by sailing. And we see this in the radiocarbon dates very easily. So these um, ISO lines are basically built um, with, um, using the radiocarbon dates and the colors just in, indicate where you have the first settlements and how they spread. And we have very fast spread, for instance, in, in the Rhone River and we have uh, regions that really resist to the uh, onset of agriculture like um, Eastern and Central Switzerland where we have a uh, very late uh, hunter-gatherer populations living there. So we have a progressive process of spread of farming that then kind of um, establishes itself um, through prehistory. Uh, you will see in case someone is interested, some of the publications we've been doing over the past years. This is something we still 
have not published, but it should be sometime, sometime soon, just for you to get an overview every 200 years of occupation in this study area. So the colors indicate sites per uh, square kilometer and how it shifts and how it's not always just progressive, just always becoming more and more settled and more densely settled. You have phases um, where the, um, there might be some decrease of settlements, phases where we have settlements uh, dated pretty much everywhere in the study area. So also for you to see that we have also uh, settlements in all of these chronological phases. So th this is quite intense. There are some areas that are permanently um, inhabited doesn't mean that the spot is inhabited over uh, three or four thousand years, but the area and other areas are only settled at certain moments. The type of settlements in the Northwest Mediterranean is a little bit different from what you would have heard if you've ever heard about, about Chetahuyuk or the Vincha culture, where you have these so-called tell sites. These are sites that are um, develop over multiple settlement phases and then they become a mountain and it, or a mound and it's just a settlement. In the Mediterranean we have loads of caves and they were used um, for animal uh, keeping. That would be one example, but usually they also ha may have terraces in, uh, in front of the cave entrance and they were used uh, for dwelling. And usually we have very small communities, so we, mm, Often not more than 50 people would live in these uh, small settlements or villages. We also have open air sites and this is how they look. So it's mm, also not um, what one would have in mind. You have loads of pits and ditches and you need to reconstruct what fits together. Sometimes you cannot. Sometimes you have wells like this one here and in wells you have very good preservation. So you have a number of sunken features that are usually filled up with garbage and that's what we look for. We look for the garbage usually that there we find loads of plant remains that we are interested in. And in cave sites, a very typical deposit also in the Mediterranean is are these ash, ashy deposits, very organic, and this is burnt dung. So it's pretty much as if you were sampling a pile of manure or just collected um, stable waste. Luckily, these are my favorite type of sites where you have wet preservation. Usually they are in lakes, around lakes, and because of the high water table, wood is preserved in perfect conditions, and so are also seeds. So this is the site of La Draga near Girona in northern Spain, and these are like remains of the huts that <coughs> have preserved over 6,000 years in that area, and that would be a profile um, sample and you would have the so-called cultural layer in the in this part here. So you have a depth of 20, 30 centimeters with garbage again, plus construction remains, tools and so on that you can interpret um, as you desire. So these um, communities based on anthropological research since they are quite small, they also have a, a st uh, population structure that we are not anymore very familiar with. So one should imagine relatively few adults, like between six and 10, loads of children between 15, 25, and two to four elderly people. And this, of, of course, constantly changing with people leaving the settlement, people coming in because these were not closed communities, autarkic and not connecting with other people, quite the opposite but it's this sort of structure. So if people need to keep the knowledge of how farming works, how pottery needs to be produced and so on, this knowledge, if it was this small community would be in the hands of very few people. If, if men and women do different things, even less, so uh, they would be very fragile. So actually uh, what from, again, an anthropological perspective, one would assume is that they have very strong networks with nearby settlements so that the system is uh, viable on the long term. And labor force is always a limiting factor, so they cannot um, 
disturb endless uh, surfaces of land because the available work power, manpower that you have is limited, although they can collaborate, of course. So for us, it's very important to distinguish the type of preservation we have in these sites. We don't have dry preservation, as you would imagine in Egypt, for instance, where everything is preserved as it had been thrown there yesterday. But we still have, um, may have good enough preservation in dry sites or what we call dry sites. Usually you have charred plant material. So this means at some point it got in contact with fire. You don't have a representative subsample of what was used, but you may generate a representative subsample of that was charred, what was charred. And there are many steps in plant processing that um, make plants come into contact with uh, fire. In wet sites, it's quite different. There you may have at least a good representation of everything that was thrown as garbage. So um, chaff remains of cereals in uncharted conditions, seeds, leaves, and then also fish remains, insects, everything is much better preserved. So in our project, we really went to look for wet sites or sites with waterlogged uh, deposits. And basically what you do is taking loads of sediment samples, usually several hundred liters per site. This needs to be sieved, and then you know, on the principle of density, you remove charred material on dry sites and you recover it in the sieves and then you sort it. So it's a very long process and there's a, yeah, uh, usually more than one person involved because it's quite a, a workload. And you may also use other sieving techniques that are a bit more accurate, but also take more time. So that's basically what we do. We need to go to the sites, pick the features that we want to sample, process the sediment, sort, and then recover the plant remains and hope that there will be some identifiable plant remains. So if you would go to the literature on uh, Neolithic farming and you don't have to go really um, back in time, you would read things like these people who would practice primitive agriculture or they were exploring the territory and they were kind of using trial and error to improve their practices. They you would also read theories on the effects of soil depletion, like these people would not really control what they are doing. So in a few generations, the soils would not be productive and then the population collapses and there's different uh, theories on this or they would practice shifting agriculture, which in the minds of archeologists, it's a simple type of agriculture because it seems like you can go anywhere, burn the forest down, you grow there your crops for one or two years and then you go elsewhere. And at the same time, there's also like this underlining assumption that the cereals would provide almost, um, or the majority of the dietary um, intake. So. You, you get very, very confused if you mm, think everybody's right in, in these assumptions so because it, they are partly contradictory. What we've been observing over the past 20, 30 years is that we have a subsistence based on a large diversity of plants, not just domesticated plants, but also loads of wild plants and within the domesticated ones, quite diverse. So you have cereals, but you also have oil plants and you have pulses and that you have a very integrated plant and animal management. So um, everybody, everything worked as a cycle and animals were consuming some of the cultivated plants. The animals were probably browsing on the stubble after harvesting uh, and then the dung was used as, as a manure, natural manuring. And the fields were actually much more permanent than what would one would have imagined. And that's something we see in the weeds that come with the cereals. So this is a bit uh, summary of the crop diversity we have. We have in the Neolithic, einkorn, emmer, timofifs, wheat. That's a wheat that nowadays is only grown in the Caucasus mainly. You also have durum wheat in the Mediterranean area and naked and hulled barley. I don't know how familiar you are with this um, diversity of cereals, um, but that's why I'm presenting them here. And on top of that, you also have opium poppy, mostly in the Western Mediterranean. I will speak about it shortly. 
flux and pulses such as lentil, pea, or fava bean. So relatively uh, broad spectrum, and that's what we managed to identify so far. And I'm showing here the colors that I will use during the presentation. So basically greenish colors for wheat and brownish colors for barleys. And what we will discuss is mostly the switch between naked and gloom weeds, what we call gloom weeds, which include the timofaves, wheat, uh, emmer, and einkorn. So for archaeologists, this distinction between gloom weeds and free threshing cereals is super important because the tasks that are involved in obtaining the clean product that you can eat are different. And that's su summarized in this figure. So um, gloom weeds, when they are threshed, so basically like when you um, process them to remove the grain, the first thing you get are spikelets and you still have to pound them to remove the grain. So as a sort of a byproduct, you get this chaff. So that's the spikelet fork. That's the basis of the spikelet. And we find this in many pits and uh, they are relatively easy to identify. They are quite diagnostic for the species. When you have free threshing cereals, you skip this step because after threshing, you directly get the rachis, so the axis of the year, and the grain. So that's much easier. It, the one would assume one would prefer to have free threshing cereals, but gloom weeds have some other advantages. So when we have changes in the crop assemblages and uh, region that was growing naked wheat moves to gloom weeds, something is going on. And that's why this project kind of started. The requirements of these different cereals are different, and this partly has to do with the region where they were domesticated. So einkorn comes from the Taurus area, uh, wet area in the mountains, so it's much more tolerance of wet tolerant of wet climate, while emmer was a bit more in, in the southern parts, um, in drier areas, and so it's a bit more tolerant of dry conditions, but it grows well in, in wet conditions, while Timofeev wheat, in theory, is good, um, has a good tolerance of wet conditions. And for naked weeds, we have both types. So there, there's bread wheat and there's durum wheat. Durum wheat is what we have in the Mediterranean, and this one is really adapted to dry climate. Bread wheat is much more um, flexible and can be grown in, in wetter areas. And then we have the barleys that have a shorter vegetative period and, and they are much more uh, flexible. So they can be grown where other cereals do not produce uh, such good harvests and they are have a higher a tolerance against salinity and they don't need, um, or they can, can skip or avoid the summer droughts because they are already ripe before the summer starts. So this is partly a summary of um, what I just said, but um, in the project we basically are uh, considering um, risk factors affecting these um, decisions uh, in changing crops on the basis of climate variability and pests. Innovation, of course, plays an important role, but within the Neolithic, we don't have huge uh, technological innovations. But in theory, we can assume that we have a domestic scale of decision making. So this could make the patterns very difficult to recognize, but as we will see, there are actually broad scale patterns. So um, that stays at the a more nuanced level, this uh, domestic scale of decision making. Yes, so I will move on from this long introduction. Just to tell you one of the key issues of the project that we are considering is that the Neolithic farming can be divided into two different worlds. The Neolithic sp spreads towards the southern Balkans, uh, current Greece, and from there, one route of spread moves to the north through the central northern Balkans, Carpathian Basin, and further into Europe, northern Europe, and the other route is uh, along the sea. And these two routes have different crops moving with them. So 
in the Balkans, they very lo quickly lose most of the pulses and naked wheat. And they basically stay with einkorn, emmer, and pea. Those are the most important crops, barley as well. While in the Mediterranean, they keep naked wheat, naked barley, and some more pulses. Very interestingly, it's in this area where opium poppy starts to appear in great numbers. So it's our proposal that it was domesticated in this area. Well, it was already a, a debate earlier on, and we put some effort to work into that. And for this, we used geometric morphometrics. So basically, we worked with seed shape analysis. We generated a model using a current um, papaver species in order to classify our um, archaeological remains. And this is something we already published. It worked really well. And what we are about to publish are the global results that we got for our study area. We have early sites in the Mediterranean, also in, in the Southern Alps, and then we have plenty pile, pile dwellings with waterlogged preservation in Switzerland. So when we've analyzed the seeds coming from these sites, we always took waterlogged seeds so that charring was not affecting them. We saw that the Mediterranean sites cluster together and they seem to be mostly wild, so it doesn't seem that they are domesticating the plant yet. The site in the southern Alps looks very similar to the first pile dwellings north of the Alps in Switzerland, so the connections here north-south of the Alps become very obvious. There are further connections. They are cultivating the same crops and so on. So that was very nice that these uh, sites were clustering together. And then um, as the pile dwelling world develops in Switzerland, these seeds keep increasing. And when we classify them into wild or domestic, we always have more higher and higher percentages of domestic type of seeds. So um, long uh, story short, we observe uh, this process of domestication of a new crop in the Western Mediterranean that was not necessarily part of the um, founder crops in Southwest Asia. This was like a side product of the project, which actually concentrates on agricultural change. So we analyzed sites, we collated loads of data just to detect in which moments of the Neolithic period we observed changes in the crops, and then we went to look for causes of these changes. Basically, as I mentioned, pests and climatic uh, variability, and then possible resilience strategies, like we, do we observe some special management of those crops, an increase in gathering or exchange networks. And we are working in this area that actually connects these two routes of spread. So we get very clearly Mediterranean-influenced uh, sites, and then we also have influence from the Balkans and Central Europe. That's, again, summarizing what I just said, so I will move forward. These are the sites that we have investigated, and we've put special effort in those uh, red dots where we have waterlogged preservation conditions, and there we look for insect remains potential evidence of pests and, um, of course, uh, crops and uh, use of wild plants and so on. So that was uh, one of the main questions, which plants are being grown, how are they, are be they are being stored and in which amounts. So we were looking at these storage capacities from silo pits. So these are archaeological features that sometimes no one cares too much about. We look for insect or possible evidence of plagues, we use the crop remains to approach uh, growing conditions of these crops, and we try to have all of our uh, settlement phases properly dated. This is the team who have been doing a lot, if not most of the work. And it's very interdisciplinary from people working with radiocarbon dates and stable isotopes to several archaeobotanists, specialists on small mammals and insects. And also now I have a postdoc working on computational archaeology. I forgot to translate this slide. Never mind. And so uh, it was really a unique opportunity to have such a broad 
uh, team working for uh, the same purpose. Just to show what we are now working on uh, regarding uh, computational um, archaeology or machine learning, this would be we are taking all radiocarbon dated sites with associated ecological conditions, climatic conditions at present, and modeling where we should have similar settlements at a given time, where you would have the same ecological climatic conditions. And in purple, you have these areas marked for two periods within the project scope at the beginning of the Neolithic and at the end. And you can observe that there are significant differences and we can do the same with crops. So we can take the sites where we have certain crops, use model paleoclimatic data of the conditions under which those crops were growing in the past and where we would have similar conditions, we could expect also the same crops to be grown. So that's something that had not been attempted before in our area. And it, uh, I'm looking forward to the results we are going to generate. But I'm presenting now some of the results we do have. These are radiocarbon dates on uh, different sorts of crops. And again, this some radiocarbon probability distribution. So the peaks should indicate as moments when these crops are grown uh, more intensively. And we've defined um, or we could observe different phases. At the beginning, we have more gloom widths. So at the arrival of these farmers, basically in coastal areas, there are more gloom widths. Then we have a phase with uh, quite a lot of naked wheat dates, followed by a period with a lot of uh, naked barley and naked wheat and almost no gloom weeds. And then sharply around 4000 BC, the gloom weeds increase. When we looked at the archibotanical data and we um, also present them in a chronological axis, we get a very similar pattern. So these are directly dated crop remains, and this is just based on archaeobotanical analysis that are not always dated. But we see again uh, that at the beginning we have a lot of gloom weeds, then we have a phase with more uh, naked wheat, naked barley, and then from 4,000 onwards, the gloom weeds increase again. And this has been um, the focus of our research during this time. And I mentioned our work on storage capacity, and this would be a completely other talk, but I'm just going to focus on the average capacity of these features. And it's the lowest that we have in prehistory. So as societies develop in our study area, they keep increasing the storage capacity of silo pits. So we actually think that these average capacities kind of indicate us the productivity of that each family is achieving. Of course, one family could have three silo pits and we cannot prove that. But since we see this progression over time, we think it's possible that they are actually reflecting the, um, how much they are producing on average um, during the Neolithic. And this is considered to be not enough for a diet based uh, on cereals for a nuclear family. So at least 1,200 liters would be what you would expect so that there is enough to sow for the following year. And yes, so that's one thing um, we are keeping in mind, whether it is possible that in the Neolithic farmers are not producing 100% of their um, diet. In relation to this, we've studied some sites with waterlogged preservation, such as Zurich Parkhaus Opera, which um, Fritz mentioned before. And here um, we could make very um, complex, the process was very simple, but complex in the number of data we were using, estimations of the absolute number of fruits that were gathered over the about 30 years of settlement of the site and we calculated calories and then established um, relative proportions of the different resources and that's what you see here and certainly crops um, bring a good amount of uh, calories but wild plants uh, wild apple so crab apple acorn and hazelnut 
bring a lot. And there are houses that seem to be gathering on average 200 kilos of hazelnuts per year, 200 kilos of crab apple uh, per year. So that's a lot more than just fallback food. It looks like part of the system. Very similar results uh, were got, uh, gotten at this other pile dwelling site where we had different phases uh, within 100 years of occupation. And what you see here in dark uh, brown uh, is the val and the calories also estimated for wild plants. And what is interesting is that it's not stable over time. So we probably have a very flexible economy where when necessary, gathering was very systematically done in high amounts. And maybe when not necessary, um, it could be reduced. And in this case, it coincided with several proxies that indicate drier climate. And because they are growing hard wheat in Switzerland in the late Neolithic, this is a crop that is perfectly adapted to the Mediterranean climate, not so much to central to temperate climate. Maybe it's in drier years when they get better crops and uh, it kind of fitted together in this narrative that um, depending on um, the yearly climate conditions, uh, the economy will adapt uh, to the needs. And I mentioned besides climate, we would look into um, uh, pests as possible risks. There had been some studies on uh, prehistoric pests in Europe, but mainly for Central Europe. So this is a synthesis of two very well-known specialists, and there's nothing in, in the Western Mediterranean. So um, there was a whole theory of why, on top of everything, they had this issue that they were finding the grain weevil in the Neolithic, so Citophilus granarius, and then it disappears. So they were saying maybe because they are storing in silo pits and that's a very confined environment, the insects could not reproduce and they got rid of them until the Roman times. So the Romans, again, um, changed many things, but we had no narrative for uh, our area. So again, a short um, glimpse into our results, once you look for these remains, they certainly appear. So we've not only found, found remains of wheat weevil and the grain uh, beetle, so Orithaephilus surinamensis, and this was only found in, in the Southern Alps in Italy, but um, the wheat weevil was found both in uh, at both sides of, of the marine, um, this uh, marine ops, can't remember how they call them now. Um, we also found the pea weevil in several um, areas. And at one particular site, uh, we also think the wood mouse uh, found a niche as a pest, crop pest, and, and that it was probably like that until uh, the um, common uh, mouse uh, arrived into our area. Paleoclimate is still an issue that we need to work on um, in, in prehistories, especially that is relevant for the study region where we are working. We have very broad um, models, but not for our um, study areas. But we recently found this publication where we uh, where they produced really model data, paleoclimatic data, transient, worldwide that one can break down to um, whichever area of the planet uh, you are working on. So now we are having a look at the annual mean temperature where we see a, an increased trend. So we start in quite um, slightly colder conditions in uh, average uh, mean temperature, also with apparently a dry phase, and then we have um, a period of uh, not real stability, but somehow um, a slightly uh, higher precipitation and mean annual temperature. In parallel, I plotted here our main trends in the crops. So the gloom weeds in dark green, they seem to coincide with this kind of uh, colder and slightly um, drier phase. And there's this uh, very dry episode probably here 
where we observe a switch to naked wheat, then uh, naked wheat and naked barley for the fifth millennium, really successful until at this point, we observe again a change towards um, gloom wheats, and it's not so obvious that it has to do with um, climate. So you probably know how weather can affect the growth of um, cereals, uh, especially there's some very key points where um, cereals are very sensitive to frost or drought. And in the Mediterranean area, it's basically water availability, which is a limiting factor. So what we did is we used stable isotope analysis uh, of carbon and nitrogen to um, see a little bit the growing conditions of this um, cereal. So we used the chart grains um, for these measurements, and we relied basically on the carbon to observe water availability, and depending on the values that we had on the carbon, we looked or not into the nitrogen, because we always observe that the, it is highly dependent uh, on the carbon. So in very dry conditions, which we sometimes detect, the nitrogen that just goes up and it doesn't mean that they are uh, being manured or anything. So for the last part of the talk, I hope I'm not taking too long, um, I will take these two um, moments of um, agricultural change. The first one is um, quite shorter. We took um, some of the key sites in the Western Mediterranean from Arene Candide in the Ligurian coast to Cova de las Cendras in Alicante that cover roughly these first thousand years of the uh, Neolithic period. And we measured stable isotopes of the main cereals that um, have been recovered at these sites. In Arene Candide, so the crop patterns pretty much mirror what I said um, is the general trend. So uh, at a Candide, which has the earliest deposit, the deposits, we have more gloom weeds. Also, in, in these other sites that are also dated to around 5,400, Cova Gran, Cova da Cansadurni, Cova da Las Cendras, they all have high amounts of gloom weeds. And then sites start to appear where um, either barley or naked wheat are uh, dominant. So we could observe the trends uh, on carbon stable isotopes for these sites. And these two images pretty much show the, the same. These are dated values of carbon, and these are just the full assemblages uh, for these sites, all of them ordered in, in chronological sense. And what we grasp very well is this kind of uh, drier phase around 5,400, right before or just at the time when naked wheat, um, just before naked wheat starts becoming the main crop in the area. One has to say also that in this spread towards the Iberian Peninsula, these farmers faced the driest um, climate they have seen since they left uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, so the um, climate is, is quite wetter um, from the um, uh, parallel uh, 43 in comparison to the Iberian coast. So that was an extra challenge uh, to spread farming practices in this area. And we see that, that after this um, signal of dryness, we have a change towards naked wheat. So in this case, our interpretation is that here climate was really a driving force, both the local climate together with uh, an event of um, drier conditions, and that it was advantageous for these farmers that they had not get rid of naked wheat before, like it happened in the volcanic route where they are no longer cultivating naked wheat, because since it was still available, they could actually chose to use naked wheat, which was actually successful for the following a thousand years. So it was really this starting point where they had a broader choice of cereals that allowed them to go um, to move on to be resilient in front of uh, this um, episode of po um, possible higher dryness and, and get, get on with it. In 4000 BC, we have a different pattern. We have this 
opposite change from naked wheat to gloom wheats. And we have two case studies that by chance, it was not planned, cover this period. Um, one is Isolino di Varese. This is a beautiful little island in the Varese Lake, northern Italy. And the second one is Libagnol. This is an open air site, so full of pits, as you saw before, with three wells like this one. And wells have a good chance to still have remained since the Neolithic period under the water table. And there we can find also waterlogged plant remains. So I start with Libagnol, with, where we have this transition between 4,200 to 3,800 BC. So across the 4,000 threshold. And these are uh, the plant remains that we found in this well, so extraordinarily well preserved and indicating as a very clear pattern. These are the three wells that are actually dated to slightly different time periods. And with time, we see the increase of gloom widths. So that was very clear at the site. And we also could detect, as I showed before, several uh, crop pests. We had very large amounts of Cetophilus granarius in this um, well dated around 4000 BC, but then it almost disappears or it decreases significantly in the last well. And also in this central um, phase, we have loads of remains of wood mouse, and it seems to be like a full population from babies <laughs> to uh, adults. And it is very unlikely, in our opinion, that they just fell into the um, well and died. They are good climbers, and it is possible that they were even uh, hunted, killed, and thrown into the well. We have evidence of their uh, attacks on the um, wild fruits that had been gathered at the site. We measure stable isotopes where, when we had grain, so we don't have huge amounts of data on this. The carbon is not showing anything that we have detected so far. And I'm only highlighting these val uh, nitrogen values here for naked wheat. And that would be the latest phase of the well. And that's when naked wheat almost disappears. So it's like at the last moment where we have mostly gloom wheat remains, maybe they try to still get a good harvest of naked wheat, but for some reason they couldn't manage. But it seems that naked wheat at this phase received uh, better um, so soils, uh, at least more nutrient were available uh, for this crop. At Isolino, Virginia, I said we have um, a broader chronology represented, but we also have this phase um, around 4000 BC. The site is um, really unique. Um, here you see dates of similar pile dwellings in the Mediterranean. We don't have many. There's this Pilio in Greece, La Marmota and La Draga, and they all dated quite old. So La Draga ends around 5000 BC. And then we didn't have any pile dwellings until 4300 in Switzerland. So there was no connection between um, these two areas. And Isolino covers precisely this period between um, both regions. And the crops are just typical for the Western Mediterranean. So it's very clear to us that the farming uh, that is being practiced at the site doesn't come from the volcanic region, but from the Western Mediterranean. And that from here, it probably um, connected to Switzerland. We saw sh shortly before that poppy seeds also showed this very strong connection north and south of the Alps. So the site is per se very interesting. And we see here again the evolution of the crops in these bar plots. And after 4000 BC, again, loads of gloom widths as um, we are expecting now for all sites dated after 4000 BC. At this site, we also have loads of evidence for Cetophilus granarius and uh, the grain beetle um, before, uh, before 4000. After 4000, with this major shift towards gloom widths, Cetophilus disappears from our samples. It may be that we have not captured, but 
it disappears from the site from for what we know. And we only have a few remains left of uh, the grain beetle. These two pests together are really damaging uh, for the crops because one attacks first and then uh, the grain beetle just uh, feeds from the leftovers and they can really spoil a whole harvest. So one of the hypotheses would be, could they be changing uh, from switching from naked wheat to gloom weeds just to get rid of these uh, pests? Here are just some examples of the beautifully preserved plant material. There's, of course, charred material, but also uncharred. These are remains of flax, barley, naked wheat, and also plenty of wild plants. As I showed before, there's wild grape, oh, sorry, acorn, uh, crab apple, uh, water chestnut, bramble, blather cherry, wild strawberry, really a broad um, gathering strategy that they had in parallel to the um, um, growing of crops. Here again, the stable isotopes were not super useful. The area is very wet and we have very high values of um, um, Delta 13C. When we look at nitrogen, what we see is constancy, which is something that we are also interested in proving because I, I said at the beginning, one of the Thing, the assumptions we have is that in the Neolithic, the soils were depleted, but if we have continuation in the nitrogen values, at least we have no proof that uh, soils are being depleted. With wheat, uh, we have a different story. So it seems that at the beginning, they might have tried to have good soils, uh, good growing conditions um, uh, for wheat, may maybe manuring uh, those fields in some way. Later on, the focus seems to stay with barley and not so much um, with wheat. And this is maybe because the environment was really, or the climate was too wet for, for naked wheat. That's a possibility. So in, in these two case studies, we have a similar switch from naked wheat to gloom wheat, but slightly different patterns. In both cases, we have detected pests and they may have a decisive um, role in this change of crops. In Le Bagnol, they do not completely get rid of the um, wheat weevil. In Isolino, they seem to get rid of it, or that's what our data is showing, but still some remains of the wheat beetle remained, or the grain beetle, but, and we observed this uh, increased nitrogen values for naked wheat at Libanol that we do not observe at Isolino, where they seem to kind of put lower emphasis on naked wheat over time. So even though the changes are apparently the same, there is some level of decision making that we can detect that is different between the two sides. Still, it's hard to grasp at this moment for us why multiple sites at the same time are choosing to change from naked wheat to gloom weeds. Like, are these really the networks that are making people decide on the same direction because they observe nearby farmers are successful in this change? And one thing we can do and we will do is to continue dating, gravity carbonating a lot and really testing if we can trace the path of this switch, but it might be at such a fine chronological scale that we miss it because with radical carbon dates you don't get um, uh, one year as a result you get um, quite a broad uh, result sometimes of uh, uh, several decades so what we are observing is that in the neolithic we have farming system that is based on a relatively high crop diversity and that farmers probably we're aware that this diversity was necessary to, in order to be able to make decisions. We can recognize global trends and certain continuity in the productivity. Um, the settlements are long lasting. Um, we don't see decreasing nitrogen levels often. So all of these are indications that the, some of these assumptions that I mentioned at the beginning at the moment have no uh, real basis. And also this intensive gathering evidence together with um, the capacities that we observe in underground storage um, facilities 
also indicate that cereals may not have been as important in the diet as we were imagining. So it's interesting that we can recognize these changes at a, a broad scale and they have to be taken into account just like archaeologists would look at pottery and when there is a different style that must mean something in our case for crops it would be a similar sort of change risks need to be taken into account agricultural risk which is not that common so research on pests and climate variability at a local scale needs to be integrated in our investigations we have observed that stable isotope analysis contribute to new ones, the um, information we are getting from uh, the crops themselves. And we need to do more research on these exchange networks to see how, uh, which role they are playing when uh, people are making these decisions on changing crops. So I sometimes like to think on maybe because I'm just passionate about it, but for me, Neolithic farming in Europe is our indigenous farming. We don't have indigenous uh, farming in Europe anymore. Um, it depends what you would call indigenous, but it's basically industrial uh, scale uh, farming. So it's very difficult to, to have an alternative that is local and that uh, we can use. So here, uh, Archaeology can bring in uh, new data uh, for very large areas, obviously, but also long periods of time, which might be interesting. We just need to be able to present it in a way that is understandable, useful, and yeah, reliable. In this system, we see this high crop diversity, which is nowadays um, a thing and becoming more important. Um, but basically because it, it was economically interesting. So these different ripening periods and the uses and their different resistance to diseases was the basis of the system. The intensive use of wild plants was necessarily integrated in that economy and not because they were bad farmers, just because it made the economy more resilient. We also, I did not talk about weeds and so on, but um, we observe a higher biodiversity on the arable plot and around the settlements, that's something um, that is also being uh, recovered currently, um, but in general, the trend over the past uh, couple hundred of years has been to reduce this uh, agricultural biodiversity and um, ecosystems um, connected to crops. So increase, we observed that the relationship to nature was quite different to what we even know historically. Um, it, it was everything much wilder than uh, we know even nowadays in uh, farming environments. The network seemed to be an essential part of this system. So it also doesn't work if networks are not working. And of course, the core of this food security is the local production and uh, storage. So th these might be some buzzwords to think about and, and see in which way from archaeology we could contribute further to <coughs> current problematics. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ferran, uh, for this very interesting presentation. I myself wanted to ask a question first, uh, but make an observation as well. Uh, it's very interesting what you were saying about uh, the uh, the beetles, the grain beetles that infected the, uh, especially the naked uh, cereals. And then we see that too in our own test fields. We see there, and also in our own stores, we had unfortunately an infestation of these uh, beetles, but they preferentially went for the naked cereals of course. and not for the health ones. And you see it also with birds, with predation. Also the sowing seed that you put out on the field, they preferentially go for the uh, the naked and not for the health. So that was very interesting. Uh, but I wanted to ask about the storage bins that you uh, mentioned. Do you there, when calculating these volumes, also compensate for the differences in volume and density between uh, naked and hulled weeds? Because there's very different... Uh... Yes, I actually forgot to mention it, um, and I anyways spoke for very long, but it was in the case of Le Bagnol where we discussed this specially because 
there, like in Isolino, we don't have storage pits. It's too wet probably, and they are storing in the huts. But in Libanol and in southern France in general, you have many such storage pits. So our hypothesis was if they were growing naked wheat until 4000 BC, and then they switch to gloom wheat, they should increase the volume of those storage pits because they will need double the volume probably to store the same crop. But the storage capacity in average is the same, at least as did 200 years after um, 4000 BC. So our immediate, well, there were a number of hypotheses, like maybe they are always producing silo pits in the same shape and size, and they just decide to produce two instead of one. Or maybe the harvest was not that high because they were still trying to get enough from naked wheat, but it was not working, and they only had the gloom wheats eventually. Um, so there's, we do not observe an increase in storage capacity, even though they are switching to gloom wheats. So that's interesting, I think. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions in the audience? Thanks. I, I have uh, lots of questions, but, but uh, for, for me, uh, I think the, the thing that, that I wonder the most about is uh, the time and spatial scale on which these decisions are playing out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're talking about, you know, they switch from, uh, they switch between naked and gloom weeds. Is this that they're growing both types and then they preferentially plant one versus the other? or different farmers or, or different communities are growing different types and then there's some sort of trade going on? How, like what's, what's the spatial scale on which they're deciding what kinds of crops to sow? Yeah, it, depending on the site, we can work at the domestic unit level. In these sites, we cannot, like we can in pile dwellings in Switzerland where if you are excavating large areas, you have the huts and you know what each family is actually cultivating and you can observe differences between huts. For the Mediterranean, we work as a, as a sort of average. So if the trend is very clear, we will observe these large amounts of gloom weeds on many sites, which is what we have at this um, period. So on average, we observe people tend to grow uh, a lot more gloom weeds, but we cannot tell if these are 75% of the households or um, 50 percent and they are overrepresented, but there is a general trend on multiple sites. Like we try to make to base this on a repetitive pattern and not just one sample, of course. But it you cannot really know um, at which re resolution you are working, like how many households are represented in there. Thanks for the nice pre presentation. A, a very naive question because we're completely out of the field. So probably very just, just, difficult. Very, no, 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 no. Actually, it's, I mean, you have been investigating. You might have uh, asked or wonder yourself the same question many, many times. What are the connected to the question that uh, Christopher asked? What are the social, uh, let's say, reasons why they decide to do uh, these kind of uh, switches? I mean, we, we always tend to. Yeah link the farmer practice to economics and better advantages, but back to the Neolithic, what was the reasons to do this? Then the second question is like more, even more naive, the choice of the, of the test fields. I mean, like, I mean, the, the, the geographical choice, why from Pyrenees to, yes. to Dolomites? And I mean, of course it must be because there were more people living there probably, but I would like to, to know this. Thank you. I may start with this question because uh, it's fresher in my mind. It, we are very much um, dependent on where research has been done. And if you wanted a good spatial and chronological coverage, we could not really move towards southern Italy or southern Spain, because um, you, you would then have many missing periods, and so you could not see these broad patterns. And from Catalonia, southern France, northern Italy, and Switzerland, there have been um, 300 sites investigated for the for the Neolithic period. So that offered a, a, a good starting point for for such a research. 
So hopefully this also encourages in other, other nearby areas to generate similar, similar data sets that they can kind of test against our results. The social reasons behind agricultural change can be as complex as you can imagine. Their taste and food products are involved as well because what you produce with naked wheat is usually some sort of bulgur with durum wheat. What you could produce with emmer could be bread. With einkorn, also some sort of bulgur. So it depends. It might be purely taste. And that, but because it changes in a large area, you're trying to exclude anything that would be that would sound to us in our mindset like a personal decision. Because if it changes at that particular time in a large area, so you start thinking, could it be like people arriving from the Balkans where they have been growing all the way through the uh, Neolithic these gloom weeds? And of course, this could be an option. So then we would try to test if radiocarbon dates allow us to see a wave from east to west. And that's something we still have to do. So we keep generating hypotheses and try to test them with the data, but sometimes the data, like the resolution you would want, uh, is not what you have. So. Yeah, I mean, it's there, of course. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And we have some questions also in the chat already, so I'm just going to read them so you can Please. answer. Uh, we have Mark Arts, who says, very interesting presentation, thanks a lot. What would be the reasons that the cultivation of pulses was quickly lost upon the movement of agriculture to Western Central Europe? And how did people compensate for the loss of these protein-rich foods in their diet? Excellent question. Like the compensation of proteins, I guess, is through milk and cheese. And so recent research in the area is proving that um, milk derived products are being generated or that the pots contain uh, evidence of uh, milk and cheese and different animal fats. So they are certainly consuming Abundant, abundant animal um, protein and pulses may, I'm not sure, may pose difficulties in, in the agricultural cycle that they have longer dormancy periods and that are just slightly more complex. P is certainly, it, it may be just a focus on P that works really well and you find it all over Europe, even in the UK. Um, but lentils are very scarce, chickpea disappears very soon, and fava bean spreads later. So that's, it's always assumed that it's a difficulty to grow these crops that may need a little bit more time to expand uh, towards uh, the more continental European climate. Okay, then a final question here from Philippa Ryan. She says, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Great to hear about so many lines of evidence and such a wide overview. Uh, for the gloom weeds, as well as protection, I wonder too about changes to the duration slash timing of rainy months and the number of days crops to grow uh, for crops to grow. E.g. in northern Ethiopia, gloom wheat and barley are grown in the lower rainfall areas. Uh -huh. Well, it certainly depends, and, and I wouldn't... Like it may be that um, barley and, and gloom wheat match at some areas, but not necessarily, uh, um, as Philippa also knows, because barley uh, may be even better adapted to drier conditions because it ripens faster. Of course, we are always thinking of uh, autumn sowing crops. Um, and what we are trying to check is but for that, we will need more time is to compare the carbon stable isotope uh, ratios between barley and the different wheats in contemporary phases, because there you may observe whether it's spring um, rainfall or summer rainfall that is increasing. Uh, in Isolino, for instance, we have opposite trends. 
with very low significant values and many difficulties, but I, in that sense, I would certainly use it. Um, but I tried to show it here. We have isotope data for other sites dated to the 4,000, and sometimes we observe wetter conditions like in Catalonia, but in southern France, we don't. So it's not the same pattern everywhere. That's the, the difficulty. So um, you've shown that in different periods, you, there is preference for different species sometimes, perhaps implying uh, some degrees of specialization if the word can be used, or uh, in uh, some periods and places there is a higher impact of wild plants. So my mm, biased question is whether you, there is also a, a zooarchaeological component in the project that, uh, and to what extent the results from zooarchaeological studies are related and reflect this change that you see in the in archaeobotany. That's something we still have not looked at, at in detail. Um, like at Le Bagnol, Margarita Schäfer, she looked at the um, um, large animal bones as well. And the data set is too small, I guess, and we don't observe any particular differences. Um, and at the broader scale, it's hard to grasp where you really have high resolution um, data and very well preserved assemblages is in Switzerland. And there you have work of Jörg Schiebler, where he usually discusses the percentage of wild animals being hunted. And uh, sometimes they seem to coincide, like in our case at 3700 BC, it coincides with very low carbon uh, values for us. Uh, so it, it may match with his theory that around this time there was a crisis and then there was more hunting. But if you go to the Mediterranean area, you barely detect hunting, uh, hunted animals. Um, it may be preservation, that's what Jörg Schivla would say, open air sites have worse preservation and you only have cattle and whatever. And you, can, you cannot do this sort of analysis in other sites. Mm. But we should go into that direction of doing the same sort of um, analysis for animal, large animals. We haven't done it in the project. It was um, beyond our scope. Thanks. OK, well, thank you again, Ferran. Did not hear you, Annette. Today I had to do it twice. Once. It's okay. Are you next screen? So when you look. So our next speaker is a, is a local Brias fellow. So Ramji is a, so Taraka Ramji Motoro. This is the full name. So we call him uh, Ramji uh, in, in the lab. So he's from the crop production and uh, biostimulation uh, laboratory. 
So Ramji uh, got his uh, master's degree from the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. So he worked on the plant uh, herbivores interaction in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute. Then he got his, uh, he gained his uh, PhD degree at the Central European Institute of uh, Technology in uh, Czech Republic. And he worked on the role of uh, strigolactones in uh, plant development. And uh, Ramji is uh, a postdoctoral uh, fellow from uh, WBI, Wallonia Brussels uh, International. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce him and the floor is yours. Thanks, Christian. Again, if you have questions for Ramji, you just write them in the, the chat. As we are not that many people online, you can unmute also your microphone and ask for your question after you raise your hand. The floor is yours. Thanks, Christian. It's indeed a great pleasure uh, to present my work here as part of the BRIAS program. And uh, as, as in the first talk, we were speaking about uh, the Neolithical uh, agriculture, let's switch to the modern agriculture. Uh, so uh, my talk would be mainly the exploiting the natural variations in the model plant aerodopsis for impro improving the nutrient usage in the crops. But uh, like to give you a brief outline, just uh, I'll talk about myself, like uh, uh, how, how did my research career started and my pre previous PhD work and uh, I'll switch uh, to the present work I'm doing here. Uh, I'll speak a little louder so that like people don't get fall asleep. Sorry for that. Uh, so yeah, uh, just to give you a brief overview on my uh, research journey. So I started as a, I'm an engineer, a biotech and chemical engineer. And uh, I started, I switched to biological pure life sciences in my, in the masters. And uh, I was doing internship uh, in Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology. That, uh, that's where I also did my master's thesis. Uh, uh, eventually, I got a position in the uh, Czech Republic at the uh, Central European Institute of Technology in Czech. Uh, and then I, uh, I got the WBI fellowship here, uh, so with Christian. So then I started uh, working here one year ago. So just to give you a brief, uh, so during my master's and uh, during my internship in, at Max Planck, so I was mainly working on uh, role of small RNAs in plant herbivore interactions. So basically, I was uh, I was making uh, uh, bioinformatics tools for genome-wide identification of small RNA targets, and uh, at the same time, I was also uh, doing experimental uh, screening of uh, characterization of the argonaut proteins, uh, which are mainly involved in the small RNA pathway uh, in, in uh, understanding its plant role herbivore interactions. So the the plant I was working was uh, wild tobacco. Uh, it's it's quite native to Utah, and it it were uh, the herbivore host that is it's a it's very photogenic, but extremely disgusting uh, to work with. So yeah, uh, this this is uh, one of the works I was I was working on during uh, my masters. So uh, after that, I switched uh, switched back to uh, the model plant aerodopsis. So I was working on uh, strigolactones when I started my PhD. It was it was quite uh, uh, it was quite new uh, the field with respect to its uh, developmental aspects. So strigolactin was uh, very well known. Uh, uh, years ago, but like uh, they were mainly uh, connected uh, with uh, with the plant rhizosphere interactions. So th th they're, they're actually uh, are extrude extrudates uh, produced by the plant roots uh, to uh, to lure uh, the the fungi, uh, uh, arborescent mycorrhizae fun fungi, uh, to make the uh, root, uh, root nodules. So that's that was their uh, fu function that was known. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, it was identified as a hormone, uh, which was involved in at uh, di different developmental uh, developmental stages. So, which is which includes uh, like secondary thickening, uh, internode elongation, axillary bud outgrowth, leaf senescence, leaf elongation, or lateral root formations. So, uh, so uh, when when I started, it, it's it's uh, it was kind of uh, very uh, the information was very really uh, less and. Uh, so uh, it made me more curious to start with uh, its signaling pathway. So uh, the signaling pathway is uh, it has a parallel signaling pathway with the keratin. So uh, and and it is quite unclear like uh, how the signaling pathway works. And there was uh, there are almost like uh, 
uh, so many question marks with respect to the developmental aspects and stress biology and everything. So which which made me to really jump in and then uh, work on different uh, three different parts uh, of uh, strigolactin biology. So uh, uh, I'll quickly uh, run you through. I'm trying to pack like uh, some amount of research work in, in, in a couple of slides. So just please bear with me and uh, you feel free to ask the questions uh, at the end. So uh, so I took a, a initially to, start to uh, look at the signaling, sugalactin signaling. I was uh, I, I took an evolutionary approach, a multiple evolution based approach in which uh, I tried to look at the signaling pathway uh, proteins. And, and then uh, uh, from which uh, I was able to uh, reconstruct the phylogenetic tree of the, all the, uh, the signaling proteins into two different, uh, into four different uh, clusters, distant clusters. And, and then in which, uh, in, in which two, uh, one of them is a tight cluster, uh, the cluster of uh, the strigolactin pathway, whereas uh, the other, uh, uh, the one is in karakin pathway, which is a parallel signaling pathway, which is connected. Uh, and the other three, uh, other uh, two clusters which are uh, unknown uh, are still uh, not characterized in which pathways they are actually involved. So uh, at the same time, uh, I was able to distinctly uh, uh, identify uh, a functional motifs uh, which are actually differentiating between this uh, two signaling pathways, scaracin and strigolactin, uh, which were uh, further, I mean, like uh, we, we were further biochemically characterizing them. Uh, to understand like, okay, the, the, whether they are really uh, functional motifs or whether they are just uh, uh, patterns which are identified. So uh, we have clearly seen that they have, uh, they have a, a prominent role uh, which makes them different, uh, uh, which make them specific for their signaling pathways. So uh, eventually, uh, so also when I, when I started in the lab, uh, we had some uh, GWAS analysis done on those trigolactins. So from which uh, uh, we picked up a gene uh, tough protein. Uh, since I had a background in uh, microRNA, small RNA, so uh, I, I quickly uh, took up this protein, so uh, uh, which is involved in the microRNA biogenesis. Uh, so eventually we we started to uh, so we started screening, uh, uh, and it's it's very plant specific. Uh, it's 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 also absent in animals, animal uh, small RNA pathway, but it's it's present only in the plant uh, microRNA pathway. So which make uh, which makes it more interesting, and it and somehow it's actually regulated by strigolactins. So which is quite unclear. Uh, so we started to look at the phenotypes with respect to the micro micro lines, microRNA lines, uh, overexpress arts, and uh, uh, and the knockouts. So we clearly see, uh, uh, and at the same time, we also did a transcriptome-based study. Uh, so combining the expressions, uh, transcriptome, and then the phenotype. So we we have seen uh, we have seen a, a, a regulation between the strigolactins and uh, 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 and the uh, microRNA, this tough protein which is involved in the microRNA pathway. But there's the still some some question marks are uh, still there. Uh, but still, uh, we were able to clearly establish uh, a tight regulation of uh, strigolactins in, in the microRNA pathway genes eventually, which connects with the uh, phenotypes like lateral roots or hypocotyl. So the third one, uh, which uh, I was working on uh, stress. So I picked up, uh, so uh, during when I was studying, when I was looking at the transcriptome, so uh, I was able to see some uh, uh, photosynthesis genes, uh, which made me curious. So, okay, so there is some, uh, definitely some, uh, in, uh, there is some role of strigolactins with the photosynthesis. So, which made me curious to also look into, uh, uh, look into the, this uh, regulation of, uh, so how strigolactins might be regulating the photosynthesis. So, uh, so I picked up uh, highlight stress. So why highlight stress? Because it's, uh, it directly affects the photosynthesis. It's a, it's a, it has a direct impact on the photosynthesis missionary. So which, uh, so we we picked up the highlight stress, and then we did some phenotype studies. So which which which, which from which uh, it was evident that uh, 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 strigolactins were uh, able to adapt, uh, making the plants adapt uh, to the uh, uh, highlight stress. So uh, from the recovery uh, during during the recovery phase. So we we further uh, did. Uh, uh, photosynthesis efficiency tests, and then we, we looked at the metabolomics. 
So connecting the dots between the transcriptomics phenotype and then the photosynthesis efficiency and the metabol uh, metabolomics. So we were able to establish uh, uh, able to establish uh, a, a clear pathway of uh, regulation of uh, uh, sugar lactans uh, with the with the photosynthesis and and the highlight stress. So uh, coming switching back uh, to the work I'm doing here. So I was uh, as the name suggests. I was really exploiting the natural variations, uh, the natural variants that are uh, that are pre available uh, that are available in the local panel here, Belgium and Netherlands. So just to give uh, a, a quick motivation, so so uh, we are trying to solve solve the world hunger. It's a bigger motivation we have. So uh, the question and the strategy. So uh, so our lab mainly works uh, on uh, Arabopsis and uh, other other plants as well, crop plants as uh, Jorge and uh, uh, Claudia will be speaking about it. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm here working on a model plant, Arabopsis, uh, focusing on the uh, nitrogen root morphology, phylogenetics, and natural variations. Uh, from where we, we would like to translate it to uh, uh, crop plants like uh, Brassica napus uh, uh, with respect to the uh, nitrogen root markers. So, so one of the key aspects which we're working on the development and growth of the lateral roots. So uh, just to uh, come back, uh, so uh, the it, it all started with the prospection of uh, Arabopsis uh, uh, that are available locally from Belgium and Netherlands. So uh, two, uh, 210 sites were prospects were prospected uh, between uh, 2015 and 20 uh, by Christian. And uh, at the same time, he also collected the soil analysis to understand like uh, what makes it different. So that's uh, uh, to get more understanding. So then uh, we clearly see that like uh, uh, Netherlands it has more, uh, the Arabopsis that are from the Netherlands are actually more from the sandy soils, whereas uh, Brussels uh, in Belgium, uh, it's it's kind of like a, uh, different kinds of soils from uh, sandy, uh, loam sandy or, or loamy soil or silt, silt based soil. So uh, it's, it's kind of a different uh, different kinds of uh, uh, natural habitats or urban habitats, which which uh, uh, in which the this the same plant has been growing. So uh, why uh, we are we, we, we are uh, collecting from the natural uh, like uh, from the local panel. It's um, when when we already have a global panel of uh, the Arabs actions of seven thousand two hundred. So it's just a. Mainly, the, the it's it's an extensive collection collection from the urban environment, and the degree of the natural variations in the root uh, we, we have clearly seen a high degree of natural variations in the uh, in the root morphology, which is which is quite interesting for us, and the alleles with this relate to high frequency, uh, which is important, uh, which would be uh, uh, important for us, and at the same time, it's a local population with such variations uh, have a huge uh, advantage. Uh, over the global population that is available. So uh, to give you an uh, experimental outline, uh, so we did a uh, soil analysis, granulometric and mineral profile of the soils. Uh, we did a uh, root morphology uh, uh, in, in, in vitro plates and also in the common garden experiments and in low and high nitrogen. Uh, root and shoot uh, ionomes uh, with the high nitrogen and uh, we genotyped uh, using like a high sequencing. sequencing. So the in vitro studies, uh, so as I mentioned, like uh, the root morphology, we are specifically focused on. Uh, we were doing in low and high nitrogen. Uh, like th this is how uh, it usually looks, the plates, and then we try to understand uh, 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 different parameters of the roots which we are studying. I I'll show you in a minute. And uh, at the same time, also we are uh, doing the root and shoot ionomes, and also the mineral profiling of uh, that were measured. Also, also were measured in uh, root and, and shoot tissues. Yeah, just uh, I think I missed one. So, just uh, preliminary studies. So, from the initial uh, preliminary studies, uh, we have uh, we have seen that uh, there is an increase in the shoot biomass uh, with uh, with the high nitrogen treatment. Whereas, uh, in case of uh, lateral roots. So there is an increase in lateral root number with the decrease in the concentrations, uh, nitrogen concentrations. So th this is the preliminary studies we have uh, on the uh, on the change of the root uh, morphology with respect to the nitrogen. 
So further, uh, so these are the different parameters. Also, I mean, th this is the common slide also you have seen uh, from our group. So th these are the common parameters uh, which we use uh, for studying the, to understand uh, uh, root and shoot uh, phenotype traits. Uh, basically, with respect to biomass, uh, root uh, biomass, shoot biomass, uh, the total biomass of the of the plant, and uh, root to shoot ratio, like how they are changing between the roots and shoots. Uh, uh, root morpho specifically on the root morphology side, we'll be we we are looking at the length of the primary roots, uh, length of the uh, uh, so the 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 whole root can be divided into different zones. So the zone one, uh, the zone one, zone two, zone three, and zone four. Uh, and also the number of lateral roots. The number of lateral roots are actually important uh, for acquisition of the nitrogen in the soil when, when it comes. So it's it's an important uh, trait for us as well uh, to understand, to look in, in different accessions. And uh, total root length, uh, sorry. And uh, density of the density of the lateral roots and uh, in, in, in two different zones. Yeah, so uh, initially, so from the in vitro studies in the low and high nitrogens, uh, so we, we have seen uh, a, a relative, uh, this are spider plots. Uh, so we try to uh, map all the uh, the biomass trait and then uh, root morphological traits that were, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. So from which uh, we have clearly seen some uh, uh, diverse variations with respect to the lateral roots and the primary root lengths. So uh, in which there is a relative variation of this phenotype traits uh, in, in different accessions. Uh, so similarly, we also have noticed uh, a change in the mineral profiles, which made us curious also to look into mineral profiles in depth uh, further, which I will be showing in, in, in the next slides. Uh, so, uh, so we made uh, also like uh, we try to look uh, from this exploratory data analysis. So we also try to look uh, the correlations between the 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 soil type of soil uh, the root morphology and then the ionomes so we uh, with respect to the soil we clearly see there is uh, a positive correlations between the ph and calcium uh, there is a negative correlation between the potassium and aluminum so there there are a positive and uh, negative correlation with in the soil uh, with respect to the also uh, the root morphology and soil uh, root traits and then uh, and then the minerals in the soil uh, similarly, in the shoot ionome and then root ionome, uh, so so that, that, that we, we, uh, from uh, from this, uh, so we really had a a, a broad picture that uh, somehow the uh, soil uh, minerals uh, is a, there's a good correlation positively or negatively. There's a good correlation of uh, the soil mineral profile and the the morphological traits. So which uh, which is an interesting uh, thing for us. To uh, to look more in detail, uh, so uh, so we we laid out the objectives to understand uh, more in detail. Uh, so what are the associations? What are the low side that are that are actually involved? Uh, that, that could be uh, that are involved in uh, in this natural adaptations of uh, of these plants. So uh, we used a geospace based approach uh, to identify the uh, low side regulating the root and uh, root phenotypes uh, and the minerals. So similarly, we also did a bulk segregant analysis uh, specifically on the root phenotypes uh, to start with the uh, GWAS. So we did uh, uh, GWAS studies. Uh, I, I tried to remove all the, I, I'm trying to show only the beautiful plot I got, which, uh, which is with a strong association. Uh, so basically, so we had a one strong association uh, with the uh, sulfur uh, mineral. This is uh, with the this is one of the sulfur transporter. Uh, so this is one of the strong associations we had, and then uh, we are also screening for uh, other uh, morphological and uh, mineral traits, which is the the work which is still on uh, which is still going on. Uh, similarly, uh, so the bulk segregant analysis. So we had uh, two uh, contrasting phenotypes. Uh, so one uh, 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 Columbia, and then uh, the, the the which is the uh, reference commonly used. Everywhere, and uh, we we collected one of the accession from the Texel Island in, in Netherlands, which is grown in sandy soil. It has a, it has a long primary root and a less number of lateral roots, uh, which is it's a natural natural adaptation uh, that 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 was known, uh, and it's it's a contrasting phenotype. So given this contrasting phenotype, so we will uh, we we try to uh, uh, try to generate a bulks 
So crossing them, so we try to generate a bulk of uh, 600 FT individuals uh, to look at uh, the low side that could be interesting, uh, low side that is uh, involved in the in this particular uh, lateral root phenotype. So uh, this is also one one of the works that is currently in, in progress. Uh, so further, we also have a collaboration uh, with uh, Thomas Rue in, from Plant Ecology and Biochemistry Lab. So in which uh, we have, we are also looking, as I mentioned, like the, there, has, there has been a correlation of this soil variable, soil mineral profiles, and uh, and the and then the root phenotypes. So we clearly see that there is some relation. So we try to uh, collaborate with the uh, with Thomas. So to understand. Uh, uh, to understand to 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 understand more uh, in detail the the regression analysis between this uh, in vitro studies so the root morphology traits and uh, and the soil variables uh, the soil mineral contents and then uh, also the the root variables so future uh, just to give you as I said like future directions so uh, it was clearly evident uh, there has been a large diversity of the root morphological traits that are in, in, the, in the local panel itself. Uh, so there has also then uh, ionomic variations, uh, it's, which are important for the root and shoot growths. Uh, so uh, we are using uh, GWAS approach to identify the significant associations, which uh, are uh, related with this uh, particular uh, traits. And uh, bulk segregant to identify this as loci regulating the lateral root phenotype. Uh, at the same time from, from the, uh, from this high throughput uh, analysis, so we would be uh, identifying and functionally characterizing the genes uh, that are gene of interest uh, from which uh, we identified the uh, associations which are identified uh, from the previous analysis. Uh, just to acknowledge also uh, behind the scenes, we have a super villain team, uh, CPBL lab. Uh, so, uh, uh, I also mentioned like Christian is my supervisor. Thanks to everyone who is part of the lab. And uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Cheers. Thank you, Ramji. Really interesting talk. Again, um, I'm very far away from the field, but I, I think this, uh, these studies are very interesting, and especially um, uh, the GWASH uh, measurements you're talking about and the uh, strong associations you could find uh, with the roots uh, taking up uh, certain mineral contents. And here you gave the example of sulfur, but I was wondering about um, other minerals such as iron, zinc, um, do you, are you seeing strong associations with them as well, or could you talk about uh, other mineral content you're you're interested in measuring as well? Uh, sure. So uh, we also have seen uh, one association with uh, uh, manganese. So the, uh, this is one more uh, interesting one we have uh, identified. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm looking more in detail, like the associational genes, possible genes that could be involved uh, in 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 this. Uh, in this area, so that's that's one which I'm working. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, like it's it's also like uh, the minerals are kind of very much correlated with the, so they have a heavy influence on the root morphology. So this is this is one, one uh, which an interesting fact which we identified. A question in the chat. Let me go and check. Hello, Ramji. Thanks for this. Uh, thanks for this uh, presentation. Um, the the Manhattan, plot, Manhattan plot you you showed. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, so, if I understood correctly, um, the peak was associated to one specific uh, gene. Uh, and did you look at uh, the 
further at the function of this gene is this yeah it's a sulfur transporter yeah but uh did you check further about the root uh, development ah uh, yeah the so they, they they do have some mm. function with the uh, lateral roots so that's mm. also one of the reasons why I, I picked it up so there was some literature also on uh, uh, this particular transporter which it has some influence with the lateral roots and about the bulk segregant analysis, you already have results? Or you... <laughs> you know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're Actually, still struggling to find. Uh, uh, so I'm still working on that. Like uh, we still don't have uh, concrete results. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, we'll wait a little bit from the chat. This one. Marco. Thank you for your presentation, Ramsey. I was wondering, in, uh, in plants, sulfur play a role in defense in form of uh, um, uh, glucosinolate. Glucosinolate uh, are made by sulfur mm -hmm. and uh, also some uh, antioxidant uh, compounds. Do you think uh, the, you can see a relationship? But, uh, I don't know, with the transporter uh, of sulfur and the uh, defense or antioxidant uh, responses true true that, uh, that that could that would be possible but uh, we haven't focused on the antioxidants so far uh, but the glucosinolates uh, which we are but it's, it's in a different project we have been doing for the for the i mean ccm so that's but we haven't uh, done uh, with respect with this thing no thank you No more question. That one more. <laughs> uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Last one. Uh, maybe I'm too afraid to ask, but uh, I'll give I'll give it a whirl. Um, it, this uh, well, your research is primarily on uh, root morphology, um, but you uh, reference in the beginning of your talk that you're also looking ahead at um, looking at specific uh, well not just genes, but also traits that you'd like to eventually apply to uh, to other crops. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk about, well, which crops, well, cereal crops, for example, and um, which which traits do you think um, from this research can be uh, brought, Translated, brought over? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm like uh, specifically in the, in the lab. Uh, so we, we work on uh, oil seed rape, brassica, and also wheat and sorghum. So that's, that's a new project that has been started. Uh, so th these are the ones which could be like uh, uh, the translated into. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the traits specifically, uh, as I mentioned also here, it's it's mainly the roots because uh, it has a prominent role in uh, in the nitrogen acquisition from the soils. So which makes it a uh, interesting target for us to focus uh, also on on the roots rather than also on incomplete. Uh, uh, the complete plant. That are also helping the plants uh, take uh, True, like it's, it's all interesting. Oh, okay, yes. You can't do everything. <laughs> everything. That's the, yeah. Well, the focus of the research is currently only on, only on the root development. Thank you. So once more, thank you, Ramji. Can close. So the next speakers next week, March 24th, same place, same time. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure to hear Gabriela Berto. She's, uh, of course, Bria's fellow. Uh, the title of the presentation is Nanotechnology for Food Industry, Nanomaterials from Biomass. And then we will listen to Fernando Segato.
genetically engineered microorganisms in food uh, technology. So this is going to be the, the program for next week, lunch around the same time, noon, noon.